Well, good morning again, and good to see you out there. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. I want to see how many fans we have in here, okay? Uh, so, who's pulling for the Browns? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Faithful, those are faithful fans right there. Okay, seriously, uh, who wants the uh, defending, what, a five-time champion, four-time? Maybe I'm being prophetic. <laughs> New England Patriots to win. <clears throat> who wants the Patriots to win? Okay, all right. So who wants the Atlanta Falcons to win? All right, I see there's a little more excitement and enthusiasm for Atlanta than for New England. Uh, so we'll see how things turn out. We used to have big uh, Super Bowl parties here. And, uh, then we got word, oh, you can't show the Super Bowl because it's copyrighted. And, and then they were sending letters, emails out to churches. If you show the Super Bowl, and you could be fined. And so it kind of scared churches uh, you know, and, uh, out of showing that. But we had some great times and chili cook-offs. How many of you remember the chili cook-offs? Yeah, they were good stuff. So uh, we, not, we don't do that much anymore as far as large group stuff. There are maybe some small groups doing that. This evening, I know the youth ministry is going to be doing that. So um, we'll see who wins, and I hope to be watching that. And I've been a New England Patriot fan from way, way, way. I was a New England fan when Steve Grogan played. How many of you remember Steve Grogan? I'm telling my age, yeah. Steve Grogan, one of the worst quarterbacks I think ever played the game. But I somehow was a New England fan. But I like, uh, I, you know, I like Atlanta too, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, it's time to wrap football up, isn't it, and move on. Yeah, maybe basketball too. Hey, uh, I just want to say a word about Haiti. If, if, you, if you want to keep up with what we're doing in Haiti, uh, the best way to do that is to, is to get on Facebook. Uh, if, you, if you will send a request for the, the group... Gateway Mission, in, in all caps, Haiti, then your request will be approved, and you'll see kind of the insider information on Haiti. You'll see pictures. We're getting ready to, they got the wall built on the church, and we're getting ready uh, to send a team in March. Dave Martin's going to go over there with some of his family and some other folks from the church, maybe 10 or 12. Uh, we believe things have settled down enough. There are, Americans are going back in. They get a new president this week, <clears throat> so we're hoping that'll kind of uh, pacify things and settle things down. It, you know, serving Jesus is not uh, supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy, and uh, a lot of times it's dangerous. So, and it's not so dangerous that, uh, that we're afraid to go, but there's always danger when Americans travel to a foreign country. I mean, you should just know that. Anytime an American goes to another country... It's dangerous. So if you say, well, I'm not going to Haiti, but I'm going to go to some other country, anytime Americans travel to a foreign country, it can be dangerous because we uh, are hated by a lot of people in the world. So um, send a Facebook request to Gateway Mission, all caps, Haiti. There's also there's a Facebook normal page, but uh, I don't keep that updated, and I don't think whoever runs it keeps it updated as well as, uh, as it should be. So join that group. Send a request and we'll, we'll keep you updated. But we're ready for, to put a roof on that building, on the church. And I just want to keep you updated because a lot of you give money every month to sponsor these kids. And many of you are going. I'd love to have you go with me in June. I'm going to go over. I'm going to be taking my son back to get uh, you know, some identity and his roots and remind him of where he came from. That's my goal, so it should be a great trip. <clears throat> my wife will be going with me for kind of a quicker trip in June. If you'd like to go, see me about it. If you know of professional people like uh, doctors and um, dentists and people like that that go on mission trips and would like to do things, especially in the medical field, uh, reach out to them and say, hey, you should go with our church because we really need some uh, doctors. We take a lot of nurses uh, and, and sometimes... Uh, some students, but we, we need to take some doctors and dentists. So if you're a dentist, next time he's got his fingers in your mouth, say, hey, do you go to Haiti? How would you like to go to Haiti and uh, do some good work? We'd love to take some of them over there. 
Well, today to start my message, <clears throat> I want to share a story with you. Uh, it's an old story. It's been around for a long time. It was written by a guy, a preacher named Theodore Wendell. And uh, you, pr you may have heard it. If you haven't heard it, you, you should hear it, you know, at some point in your life. Uh, and you're going to hear it today. It, it's, a, it's a story that illustrates kind of what was going on in his church. He preached at a church that became inward focused and it was a dying church. And, and he wrote this story. Like I said, been around a while. And I want you to uh, listen to it. It's called the Life Saving Club. On a dangerous seacoast, where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station, uh, life station. The building was no more than a hut. And there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. And with no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the shipwrecked and the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to be associated with the station and give their time and money and effort to support the work. And so new boats were bought and new crews were trained and the little life-saving sta life station grew. Now some of these new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those who were saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were not interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired some of the members and some others, lifeboat, to be lifeboat crews to do the work. And the life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decoration, and there was a memorial lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. And these people were dirty and sick, and some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos. Immediately, the property committee hired someone to rig up a shower house outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities, activities because they felt they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. A small number of members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. The small group's members were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving sta station was founded. And history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive life-saving clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the passengers drown. You know, one of my greatest fears as uh, a preacher is that I would preach at a church that would forget that we are a life-saving station. I think that would be the fear of any preacher, that, that the church would become so inward-focused and so uh, set in, uh, in its ways that it would just forget that there are still people all around us who are lost and who are drowning in this, in this world. And so instead of having a mentality of a life-saving boat, we get kind of a cruise ship mentality. How many of you have ever been on a cruise? <clears throat> oh, cruises are great, aren't they? I've been on a couple cruises, and they are fine. I mean, if you've not been on a lot of cruises and you're going on a cruise, maybe it's your first cruise or something, you should talk to somebody that's already been. Because they'll, they'll kind of prep you for what's coming. And listen to me, you are about to be treated like royalty. 
I mean, they come and take your bags. You're like, wait, I can get, okay, you go ahead and get that. And uh, when you go to eat, like if you make sure, you know, my, there were some in my family said, ah, we don't, we don't really want to take dress up clothes. We don't, we'll, so we won't do that fancy dinner. We'll just go to the all you can eat 24 hour hamburger bar. That's enough. And so we said, no, we need to, no, you don't have to dress up. I mean, they're so casual there. You just take a pair of khaki pants and a collared shirt and, and go with your family. And so my brothers and I are sitting down and we're like, oh man, this menu, it's really some crazy things on there, but two or three of those things look good. So the first night, you know, we had our pick, really wishing, okay, maybe tomorrow night we'll try that. And then the next night came and we're like, you know, I'd really like to have this and this. And without breaking a stride, the guy said, okay, no problem. We're like, what? So that was the beginning of the end for that guy. I mean, he was busy bringing us main course dishes and, and desserts. And you're treated like royalty. How many of you, if you've never been on a cruise, would like to go on a cruise now? And you can find, yeah, you can find them at good prices too. But you know, the cruise ship mentality, I'm not saying cruises are bad. I'll probably go on another cruise at some point in my life, and maybe you've been on one, or you got one planned. They're good, but you can't keep the cruise ship mentality all the time. And the church definitely cannot develop a cruise ship mentality where everybody gets waited on. I come into this church, oh, you're going to take my bags, and you're going to do everything I want to do, and I can listen to whatever I want to, and I'm going to hear whatever I want to hear. Listen, we can't develop that, can we? We can't have a cruise ship mentality. We have to keep the life-saving boat mentality. And inevitably, what happens to a church, this is just the, the life cycle of institutions and businesses. By the way, if you're in the business world, this happens to you too. But churches especially is that the longer you are in existence and the further you get away from your origin or your, your creation date, then the more likely you are to forget the main reason you started things in the first place. In 1956, when Bobby uh, Tabor, uh, Bobby Fisher Tabor and, uh, and Helen Rose and, and uh, 16 or 17 other people came here, they had it in their mind that they were going to build something that would reach lost people. But here we are 60 years later, and if we're not careful, we might get the uh, mistaken notion that, oh, this church exists for me. I don't know if Steve shared with you last week, I think he probably did, <clears throat> he was here, I was in Taze Valley, that when that survey was done of a, of a thousand uh, larger churches and, and they were asked, why does a church exist? 89% of the respondents said the church exists for me and my family to please us to cater to us, to do what we need done in our spiritual walk. And while that happens, you know, while hopefully you're ministered to as, as a family, uh, you know, from oldest to youngest in a church, that's not the primary reason we exist. We, we're going to do that, but that's going to be taken care of when we keep our focus on the fact that there are more people like your family before your family started going to church. And they're out there, and they're headed for a Christless eternity unless somebody reaches them. And reaching them with methods of 1940s or 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s or the first 10 years of the year uh, 2000, the new millennium, is not going to work. And we're going to have to continually change our methods to reach them. So we cannot get into the cruise ship mentality. Matthew 28 gives us our mission, our marching orders. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, even to the very end of the age. So that's our, that's our job, it's to make disciples. It's to, it's to, a disciple is someone who is a follower of Christ. He's following, she's following, she's being changed, she's on a mission with Jesus. So we have been making a fearless and moral inventory of ourselves, spiritually, by asking these questions. And this question, this final question in this series, is this, who am I helping 
to, to follow Jesus? Who am I helping? Now, last week's message got us into the notion that we don't exist just for ourselves, that we need to be giving back, we need to be serving. This one's a little more personal. It's not just who are you serving, what organizations are you serving, where, where are you lining up to help other people do great things. This one is, who is it? Who am I helping to follow Jesus? There's a face, there's a name. And if there's not a face and not a name, and if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple yourself, there ought to be a face and there ought to be a name. There ought to be somebody that you can say, this is who I'm helping. Maybe you don't even know their name yet, but you see them on your journey to work every day, or you see them uh, at your work, or maybe in your neighborhood, or maybe they're in your family, whatever they are. You see them and you know they need help. So, this is our question. Who am I helping? This is an uncomfortable question because this puts the burden on every single follower of Jesus, regardless of where you are. This is not something you, that you graduate to. It's not something that, you, that you'll get to one day. It's not something that you can say, okay, I've been a Christian now five years or ten years, so now it's time for me to start reaching others with the gospel or with my story. No, The day you come to be a follower of Jesus, the day you encounter him, the moment he changes your life, that's when you are are, uh, uh, burdened, I'm going to use that word, with this task. And it's not a burden. Jesus said his was light. It, it, it It is a continuing call on your life now. That This is what you're to do. I'm just going to give you a, a, a few seconds where I'm not going to speak, it's going to be some silence in here, and I want you to think of the face of the person, or more than one people, that you're helping, and hear their name ring in your head, that you're helping to follow Jesus. Do that now. So wherever we are in our journey, there's always a next step. Nobody's arrived It's not like we can say, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. I was a Christian once. We can't say that. Everybody has has to be on this journey, and we continue doing the same thing. In John chapter 20, when Jesus uh, returned and showed himself to his disciples, they were huddled together because of fear of uh, the the Jewish leaders, and he showed them his side and his hands, and they were amazed, and he said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am what? Sending you. I don't know if you know the word for the church. The Greek word for church is a word we could pronounce, ekklesia. Say that word with me, ekklesia. Comes from two Greek words, the word ek, which is like a, a preposition, out means out, and klesia is a form of the word kaleo, which means to call. It's like when mama called you out of the street and into the house. It's time to eat. Come on. It's five o'clock, supper time, or it's getting dark. Come on. Come out of the street and into the house. That's the, that's the word, that's the combination of words that Jesus used, or that the Bible uses, when he identifies the church. We are called out. We're called out of the world. We're called out. Come in. Come in. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But here, in John 20, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, being called out is a free choice. You get to choose. Contrary to what some people say, you get to choose. You have freedom of choice. Remember the rich young ruler? He had a choice. Jesus said, you you need to do this and this. And the Bible says he made a choice. He turned away and walked. Left very sad. Because he didn't want to give up his possessions. God gives us a choice to be called out. You can say no. If you're here today and you're not a Christian... I just want to remind you, you can say no to Jesus. He is not going to twist your arm. He's not going to get you in some kind of a chokehold. I don't think. 
Maybe some things are happening in your life where you think Jesus got you in a chokehold. You ever felt like you're in a chokehold? Maybe. But once you make the choice to come in, to come from out there in, and don't think I'm referring to outside on B Street into this building, but come out of the world and into the church. Once you make that choice, now you don't have a choice about whether to go. You don't get a choice. Now, I don't know if that seems unfair to you, but when you sign up, you need to know what you're signing up for when you answer that call. And what you're signing up for is to go. I remember in my first deployment in 2003 when we were getting ready to go, and, you know, I had been in the guard for a long time. I had, uh, I had guard this weekend. I was over there this morning. I did a church service. One person came to my church service this morning. One, you know how awkward it is to do a service with one? And I gave him the whole truckload. I gave him the whole truckload. I said, well, he's here. And the Bible says we're two or three are gathered. So we sang, and he was a terrible singer. I, I just had to... I mean, he was really bad. First, I thought he was harmonizing with me. Then I realized he just couldn't sing. But we, we did the whole deal. <clears throat> but I remember in 2003, we had served alongside some, some guys, you know. Uh, as a chaplain, I, you know, I saw commanders come and go, and, and not only battalion commanders, uh, you know, the, 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 the light colonel, but also the, the company commanders. And I can still remember when we got the word that we were going to deploy, there was this one young company commander, and I'm not going to say his name because some of you may know him. I don't think you do, but who knows? And I remember how stressed he became, and he decided, oh, no, I, was, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't go. He was a, in a professional field, and he felt like it would ruin his profession. And so he actually went to the, to the adjutant general. And he stood in front of the adjutant general, and they said, he cried in front of him and said, I can't go. And here's what I wanted to say. What did you sign up for? Well, I signed up for the guard. Well, the guard was a different animal now. Years ago, maybe it was like that. Maybe you signed up under the lie that somebody said, oh, you'll never go anywhere. You'll never go anywhere. You'll never go. But I want to tell you, guard is gone, hadn't it? There's nobody in uniform, hardly, and from those days that hadn't gone. And so I'm like, why, why, why did you sign up? Listen, if you sign up, if you say yes to Jesus, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. But I want, you need to hear this. When you sign up for Jesus... You lose your rights. I know that doesn't go over well in an American audience. But you lose your rights. You lose the ability to say no. Now, I'm not saying you can't say no, because you still have freedom of choice. You can walk away. But if you're going to be a follower, you lose that. And you have to, now you have to go. Because... That's what you're in. You cannot say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go. I'm a follower, but I don't, I don't do that. You see what I'm saying? Can't do that. So we're called, but we're also sent. And so we, we, have, to, we have to consider this. Now, a lot of people say, I can't do that. You know, isn't that the preacher's job? And somebody else is supposed to do that? Am, am I the one supposed to reach out to these people? Or is it somebody else? I'm not in full-time ministry. I don't have time. Listen, all those are excuses that we use as Christians to get out of doing what we really should be doing. Here's all you need to know in order to help someone follow Jesus. Number one, you need to know Jesus. That's kind of a given, isn't it? Although there are some people, I think, who've helped people follow Jesus who weren't Christians didn't know Jesus. Maybe an atheist professor was so obtuse that you thought, I'm just going to follow Jesus because I don't like you. Usually it's the other way around, isn't it? But really, I think to help someone follow Jesus, you should know Jesus. You should know him. This past Wednesday, we, Philip uh, led us in Philippians 2, 1 through 4 in our staff study, study with the staff on Wednesdays, and we talked about the great privilege of knowing Jesus. The great privilege of knowing him and the fact that just because we know him, that's enough for us to share him. 
He's too good not to share. I mean, how can you keep something like that to yourself? I mean, it, it, it's immoral. It's immoral. It's unethical. It's unchristian to know Jesus and not to tell somebody about him. He's that good. Amen? He's that good. But you should also know this. <clears throat> know that disciples make disciples. We're not just about making converts. Sometimes I'll be reading a book or I'll be listening to someone's testimony and they'll say, yeah, I was on this airplane and God sat this person down beside me or I sat down beside this person and I was able to share the gospel with them and they, and they came to belief in Christ and, whoo, man, I'm, pat me on the back. I did so good. And then they walk away and never see the person again. He, he just made a convert, somebody that believes. We're not just about making converts, people who believe. We're about making disciples. Someone wrote this. Tyler Edwards, he said, converts are believers who live like the world. Disciples are believers who live like Jesus. Converts are focused on their own values, interests, worries, fears, priorities, and lifestyles. Disciples are focused on Jesus. Converts go to church. Disciples are the church. Converts are involved in the mission. Disciples are committed to the mission. Converts cheer from the sidelines. Disciples are in the game. Converts hear the word of God. Disciples live the word of God. Converts talk. Disciples make more disciples. You see, there's a difference in making someone who says, oh, yeah, I like that. Are you saying I don't have to change? I don't have to change my life. I don't have to do anything different. No, no, no. You can. Man, at our church, you can just come and you don't have to change. Listen, if, if we give that impression, we are wrong for doing that. The gospel changes people. So, in Luke chapter 5, there's this great story. You remember the story? This is what we call relational discipleship. Relational discipleship is when you are in a relationship with someone and you, you bring them along and you help them to know Jesus. It's like mentoring. If you're in AA, it's like sponsoring. It's, it's a commitment where you expect commitment and where you help someone get to the, uh, where they ought to be. There's this great story in Luke 5 about, you remember this story about these, uh, this guy who was crippled, Jesus is teaching, and he's, the Bible says he's doing some healing, and these, these four friends have a friend, well, I, I assume there's four, it doesn't really number them, but I assume there's four because they carried him, and maybe, maybe there was four or three, maybe there was two, I don't know, but they had this guy who was crippled, and he, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get up and do anything, so Jesus was here healing. Remember the story? And they, they tried to get him to Jesus, but it was too crowded there. So they went up on the roof. And remember what they did? They said, we're going to get our friend to Jesus. We're going to help him come to know this man who can heal him. And so they cut a hole in the roof. Remember? Cut a hole in the roof and they lowered him down. And boom, he's right there in front of Jesus. And Jesus, not only did he healing, but he forgave his sins. Incredible scene. And this is really what it means to help someone follow Jesus. So I want to give you real quickly in the next five or six or seven minutes, here's what it, here's what it means when you're going to help someone. Because you might think, okay, I know Jesus. I know I need to make a disciple, but what do I need to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to care about them. Because they, they need someone to care about them. I guarantee you there's somebody that you work with or somebody around you who is carrying some weight in their life. They're carrying around some burden because everybody has a burden. Everybody has something. And, and you should care about them, especially if you're in a position over them or, or, or if they're accountable to you or if you're next to them or close in proximity to them. You should care about them. These guys cared enough about their friend, but they said, look, buddy, uh, we're, we're not going to leave you here. He's over there healing, and we're going to get you through that crowd. We'll find a way. We will find a way because we care about you that much. Now, they could have said, today is not your day. Sorry, there's too many people over there. Did you get a ticket? Maybe if you got a ticket. You know, this wasn't the day where you could, uh, where you could be wheeled to the, through the fast lane because you're, you're handicapped or something. This was, this was a day when uh, that kind of stuff, you know, it didn't happen. If you were born that way, or if you had a problem, it, you lived a hard life. 
You lived a hard life, and the only charity you got was the charity from somebody who cared about you. They could have said, you know, maybe tomorrow he'll be back, and there won't be so many people here. No, he's healing people. There's going to always be a big crowd there. But they didn't say that. To what length will you go to help someone that you care about? A few weeks ago, I, I said a, about a friend that you have, that there's a friend that you have, hopefully, that, that you, you were broke down between here and nowhere, and you were just at that point to where it's going to be very inconvenient for anybody to help you, but you're going to call them up and you know, you're going to look through your contact list and say, no, he, he, he won't come. No, he, I know he's not going to come. He's watching TV. Oh, he'll come. This is my friend. Or maybe you don't even have to scroll through. Maybe you just that's the first thing you think of. I've got to call him. And you call him, and it's like 2 in the morning, or it's like right at his bedtime. You know, he's going to bed at this time, like it's 7.30 or something, you know. And, you, and you're calling him, and you say, I need, I need you to come. And it's going to be a two-hour, one-way drive. Uh, would you come? To what length would you go to help someone? Some of us wouldn't go very far for some people. Listen, if you're going to help someone follow Jesus, you've got to care about them. So maybe the first people you should look to help are the people you already care about. Maybe the first people you look to help should be the people you already care about. They might be sitting around the dinner table with you today. And you might have given up on them. You might have thought, no way. But you can't do that. You can't do that. Because you care about them. You care about them. So what are you going to have to fight through to help them? What junk, what lies, what mess are you going to have to fight through to help your friend or your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter or your mom or your dad? Or your child? What are you going to have to fight through to help them? Because it's going to test you. Next uh, week we start a new series called When Life Hurts. And we're going to go through some things that are some hard knocks in life. uh, Like anxiety and depression and and, uh, job loss. And uh, the death of someone uh, in our life. Suicide. These issues that really just knock people down. And we're going to... We're going to talk about those issues in this next series. When life hurts, what do you do? How do you go on? How do you finish the race? And I guarantee you there's, there's some people here today that are only here today because somebody cared about you. You're only here today because somebody cared about you. Or else you'd still be out there sitting under a bridge or sitting in jail somewhere or sitting at home. But somebody cared about you right at the moment when you needed it the most. And you're here today because of it. It's powerful. The second thing uh, that's really the coolest thing about this story is that they need someone to believe for them. Now, when I first thought about this, I thought, this is kind of cool. This This is verse 20. I want you to see verse 20. I'll show you that verse. The Bible says, after they had lowered this guy down on his mat in front of them, the, you know, you can, you can just paint this picture again. I don't have really time to elaborate on this picture, but, you know, everybody's standing there listening to Jesus, watching him heal, and all of a sudden, you, this stuff starts falling out of the ceiling. You're like, what in the world is going on up there? Is there a squirrel up there or something? What's happening? And you, you, see, you see the faces of these friends looking down like, okay, lower him down. And this guy comes down, and you think, it, you think Jesus was like, whoa, what is happening here? I don't know. I doubt he was, but when he came down, I assume the guys are still up there. Jesus is looking at this guy, and he's like, you guys are crazy. Crazy. Good kind of crazy. And the Bible says, when he saw whose faith? Their faith. When he saw their faith. I don't know, maybe, maybe this guy had given up. Maybe he was done. Maybe he was committing himself to a life of nothing but sitting and watching other people walk around. Maybe he was, was okay with his, his problem. Maybe he was okay with the miry mud 
just wallowing in it every day and the pity he received. Maybe he had grown accustomed to this. Maybe he didn't have any more faith. But they had faith. Jesus, when he saw their faith, he's like, you guys, wow. And then he looked at the guy and said, your sins are forgiven. Let me ask you something. Who in your life has given up? They've given up. And you don't know what to do because you tried to help them and they just put walls up. They've given up. They don't have any faith. But now's the time for you to step in and have some faith for them. You have faith for them. You can't make them believe by doing some kind of magic trick, but you can help them believe by your faith. You can inspire them. You can be an example to them, a role model, a mentor to them, and they say, wow, he went through the same thing I went through. Look at him now. That gives me hope that gives me help, that I can do this. Sometimes, you need to have faith for them. Romans 1.12 says we can be mutually encouraged by our faith. It's, it's what we do. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Because that's all we are. The last thing that I think we can learn from this story and from other stories in the Bible is that, is that we only have to tell our own story. I don't have to, you know, some people say, well, I can't share the gospel. I don't know the gospel. I don't, or I don't know the, uh, the five points of this or three points of that. I, I don't know where that scripture is in the Bible. I know it's in there somewhere, but I can't remember if it's in there or my mom's cookbook or something, you know. I can't remember. I know it's something like that. Listen, you don't have to know all that. It's good if you, I mean, you need to learn the Bible, but you just have to tell your own story. There are Case after case of people in the Gospels who met Jesus, and they just went and told their story. John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well said to her neighborhood or community, said, come and meet a man who told me all about myself. And they all came to belief because of her. John chapter 12, the Bible says people were coming not just to hear Jesus, but to hear the story of Lazarus. Yeah, Jesus, we know we love you, but man, I want to hear this story about Lazarus. What was it like when you died? What was the tomb like? Did you see a light? What was it? And, and Lazarus was just sitting there telling his story. Mark chapter 5, Jesus cast a legion of demons out of this man, put him in the pigs. Afterwards, the man said, oh, I want to go with you, Jesus. I want to follow you. Jesus said, you can follow me, but you need to follow me right here. You go, and you tell your family, and you tell your neighborhood what the Lord has done for you. John chapter 9, perhaps the most well-known, a blind man was healed by Jesus. And there was a great commotion because the, the chief priests and the leaders were trying to get Jesus on something. And they're like, wait, he can't do this. He can't forgive this man of sins. He can't, for, he, he can't heal this man. And they kept questioning this man. They questioned his parents. And the disciples were like, wow, what's going on here? And finally the guy said, look, I don't know who he is. I don't know if he's a sinner or if he's a saint. All I know is once I was blind, and now I see. Now I see. That's all I know. That's what Jesus did for me. Everybody has a story. That's all you have to share. You don't have to go build a testimony and come back and share it. Share what God's done to you. Even if you've, if you've never done anything majorly wrong in your life, you still have a story. God has helped you stay on the path. Share your story. I'll ask the band to come on up. So I want to ask you, who are you helping to follow? Because we've got to help someone. This is not a cruise ship where you come in and say, who's going to serve me today? When do I get what I want? This is a life-saving station to where now you have the great blessing and benefit of being called out of the world and being a part of the church. But never take your eyes off of those who are still in the waters, drowning. And one of those people is close to you. Some of those people you know, some of those people you can reach down and, and help pull them out. And that's what this message is about. That's what this whole series is about, is that we would be the church. Let's pray. God, thank you for calling us out of the world.
whatever we were in, thank you so much for, for making a way for us to escape sin and death and the clutches of, of the deep and the clutches of the devil. And you have made a way for us to be saved through the cross, through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, that is the gospel. And I pray that that part of our story would be loud and clear to the people around us. Help us, Lord, to help others follow you. That is your command, and is, those are our marching orders. Help us to live them out in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you stand, I just want you to think about a decision that maybe you have today. Maybe there's, maybe there's a, a decision you need to make today for Christ. It could be a first-time decision to give your life to Christ. And that could be the greatest decision of your life. And, and follow that up with baptism today. That's the, the physical demonstration of your death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. Or maybe you're here and you want to put roots down in this church because you, you want to belong somewhere. You want to have accountability and you want to be a part of a sending organization. Or maybe you need prayer or, or some other thing. But you come as we sing this song uh, as Arian leads us. And, and make a decision today to help someone.